Señoras y señores, buenos días. Quisiera agradecer a los organizadores de este evento por darme la oportunidad de dirigirme a ustedes en esta ocasión. Desafortunadamente, dado mi apuntado programa de trabajo, no puedo acompañarles personalmente en la hermosa ciudad de Lima, pero espero que mi mensaje llegue a, a todos ustedes. Hoy en mi presentación quiero entregar un resumen del estado de la pesca y la acuicultura a nivel mundial y cómo se relaciona el sector con la nutrición y la seguridad alimentaria. Discutiré el futuro y qué se necesita hacer para mejorar las perspectivas de la alimentación a la nutrición a través del pescado y me referiré a la acuicultura en el contexto del crecimiento azul. Espero que mi intervención sea de utilidad. This graph shows the state of world fisheries production. It is obvious to all, and we all know, that under present conditions, capture fisheries are leveling off at the same time as consumption per capita per year increases. This is made possible by the growth in aquaculture, the fastest growing food sector, which is now almost equal to capture fisheries for human consumption. But we still have a sizable portion going for non-human food consumption, mostly animal feed. However, as mentioned earlier, aquaculture production has expanded greatly. This growth has been disproportionate around the world, which gives us reason to believe that there is still great scope for expansion for years to come. Asia, and particularly China, lead both in production of aquaculture products as well as in consumption of fish in general. The situation of wild stocks is unacceptable. Too many stocks, or around 30% of stocks, are overfished. Even though the last two SOFIA reports have not reported an increase in this section, the statistical trend has not changed. We both have to and can change this. The dark blue area in the graph shows the stocks which are harvested within biologically sustainable levels, and the light blue shows the stocks that are fished unsustainably. The latest FAO estimates indicate that global hunger reduction continues. About 805 million people are estimated to be chronically undernourished in 2012 to 14, most of them in developing countries. This is down more than 100 million over the last decade and over 200 million lower than in 1992. In the same period, the prevalence of undernourishment has fallen from 18.7 to 11.3% globally and from 23.4 to 13.5% for the developing countries. We cannot say that there haven't been improvements, but there's still a long way to go until we reach our goal. Hunger or undernourishment is not evenly spread around the world. The largest numbers and proportions are in Asia and Africa, but Latin America and the Caribbean have their share at around 5% of the total. However, hunger is not the only problem, since large numbers suffer from various nutritional deficiencies. This is particularly true of children. In the upper right-hand part of the slide, you can see the statistics and the effects of the most serious ones. Below it, you can see the alarming trends in obesity, which increasingly causes great problems and even greater future concerns. On the bottom left is then a graph that shows what links all of this together, namely poverty, which is intrinsically linked to hunger, nutritional deficiencies, and obesity wherever you look. Let us now return to fish. As you can see from the bottom left-hand corner, fish is full of essential micronutrients, 
high quality proteins and fats which supply both energy and essential omega-3 fatty acids. The table on the bottom right shows how relatively little is needed on a daily basis to fulfill these requirements. One little fish, like the one on the right, can supply all of these needs if ingested whole. Protein is however considered conventionally as the most important nutritional element supplied by fish. In the graph in the top left hand corner, you can see that fish supplies almost 17% of the world's animal protein, variable between region and lowest in fact in Latin America and the Caribbean region. It is relatively more important in low income food deficit countries. In the graph in the top right corner, you can see that the lower the total animal protein intake is, the higher the level of fish protein is. The blue and red dots of the African and Asian countries all cluster towards the y-axis or the left in the graph. The size of the bubbles, especially in the case of Asia, represented by red bubbles, indicates the size of the populations behind the country statistics. The story to take home from this graph is that LAFDCs are especially sensitive to any reduction in the supply of fish protein, which would reflect very negatively in the total animal protein intake. The role of the omega-3 fatty acids is an especially important one, and the medical doctor, Professor Michael Crawford of Imperial College London, maintains that Homo sapiens, that is, our own species, didn't start to think rationally until we moved to the coast or the rivers and started fishing and eating fish. He further says that the future of mankind, therefore, relies on fish and the oceans. A sobering thought. Back to more mundane thoughts. As you can see from this value chain graph, the socio-economic contribution of fish is considerable. This builds up through the value chain, from capture and primary production, through the various levels of processing, distribution and marketing, coming possibly to a level above 10% of world population relying on fish for their livelihoods. Increasingly, the value of raw materials from the oceans is being recognized and used in products higher up in the value chain. The difference in value between fish used for animal fodder and the same fish used for human consumption can be five to tenfold. If you then move into marked foods, the pharmaceutical industry and the cosmetics industry, you only add zeros to the figures and the sky is the limit. But there are threats out there in the big bad world in the form of climate change. More dead zones, areas depleted of oxygen, will become more common due to stratification from warming water. Effects on all marine animals, from microscopic phytoplankton to large predatory fish like marlins, could seriously disrupt food webs. Rapidly eroding reef habitats threaten collapse for some coastal fisheries and fish nurseries, and more than half the world's coral reefs are at medium or high risk. Harmful algal blooms could cause mass die-offs of wild and farmed fish. Climate change will impact capture fisheries in many ways, like fish migration, breeding, spawning, and feeding patterns. Fish populations will likely shift, are even already shifting away from tropical latitudes to higher latitudes, more to the north than to the south. There could also be high local extinction rates in the tropics and semi-enclosed seas. Fish size might change. Large fish will have a smaller maximum body size due to reduced oxygen capacity of seawater. But new fishing areas will come available from decreases in ice cover. Interestingly, the IPCC comes to the conclusion in their last reports that what matters most is how we react to climate change and that our reactions can be more important than the actual changes themselves. That basically puts the work of FAO and other such organizations in the spotlight. FAO has three overarching goals, which you can see in this slide. These goals translate into the five strategic objectives, organizational outcomes, outputs, 
major areas of work, and global and regional initiatives. One of the initiatives is the Blue Growth Initiative, which is anchored in SO2 as a major area of work, and in the regional initiatives in various ways depending on the region. It also translates into country level on a bilateral or a multilateral basis. The aim of the Blue Growth Initiative is to promote the sustainable use and conservation of aquatic renewable resources in an economically, socially and environmentally responsible manner. The BGI has four components, capture fisheries, ecosystem services, livelihoods trade and marketing, and aquaculture, which we will talk more about later. One of the main driving elements behind the BGI is the future predicted scenarios we see in the modeling work we have done in the fisheries and aquaculture department of FAO on our own or with others. The OECD FAO fish model projections to 2022 predicts increasing consumption in most regions of the world up to an average level of almost 21 kg per capita per annum compared to the widely recommended level of around 15 kg per capita per annum. The worrying exception is Sub-Saharan Africa, which shows a drop from the already low level of below 10 kg per capita per annum to below 8 kg in the period. Red figures represent a drop from earlier values, black figures represent an increase. The results from the World Bank FAO IFPRI fish to 2030 projections show world consumption at almost 19 kg per capita per annum. However, there are very varied changes in consumption between the regions. Most of them are positive or do not cause concern, but the drop in consumption in Sub-Saharan Africa down to below 6 kg, which is consistent with the OECD FAO prediction, is very worrying, as well as a drop in the already low levels in Latin America and the Caribbean region, and in the North Africa and Middle East region, to below 8 and 10 kilograms, respectively. Here we should remember, as I mentioned earlier, that the recommended levels are around 15 kilograms per capita per annum. It is surely obvious to all that were this to be the reality by 2030, it would be totally unacceptable to all of us. The present level of world fisheries and aquaculture consumption is 160 million tonnes a year. The predictions from the various scenarios in the Fish to 2030 report are all around 200 million tonnes per year. This is roughly consistent with the OECD FAO outlook trend. In a simplified demand model done by the FAO Fisheries and Aquaculture Department, using as drivers population growth and DTP growth based on the link between DTP and fish consumption, and essentially removing all production restrictions, the results are that the world would want to consume 260 million tonnes of fish by 2030 if supply was available. Under this scenario, the world would consume on the average just shy of 30 kilograms per capita per annum, and Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa and the Middle East region, and Latin America and the Caribbean region would all consume 3 to 5 kilograms more fish per capita per annum, or 11 to 13 kilograms per capita per annum. This would be a result by 2030 that we could all live with, but to get that result, we need to produce more fish by 2030 to the tune of 100 million tons a year more than we produce today. So, what can we do? The blue growth has four paths to respond to this, and obviously also to a number of very closely linked challenges, and these pathways are itemized in this slide. Capture fisheries, aquaculture, non-traditional ecosystem services, and the trade, post-harvest and social support path. Capture fisheries have the potential if we respond correctly to climate change and otherwise do the right things to improve both research, policies and management to increase production by 10 to 20 million tonnes per year 
and increase global fisheries income by 50 billion US dollars annually. In non-traditional ecosystem services, the sky is the limit, ranging from carbon capture in seagrass beds that can at best be five to ten times as effective as tropical forests, to rice fish systems and nature, culture and culinary tourism in coastal areas, including coral reefs. This we are already working on with some of our partner countries. In markets, post-harvest and social support, there are many areas for improvement. One, for instance, is moving resources from animal feed to human consumption, giving five to ten times higher prices. However, maybe the most important one, from an ethical point of view, is to reduce waste at all stages of the value chain. These two factors could yield 25 million tons annually in increased production. Aquaculture, however, is the most important blue growth pathway to meet the challenge of bridging the 100 million ton gap through the Global Aquaculture Advancement Platform, which was warmly received and endorsed by the Kofi Subcommittee on Aquaculture in St. Petersburg in 2013 and then at Kofi in Rome in June last year. At current growth rates, aquaculture could produce an additional 50 million tons of fish annually. However, growth rates have been falling and this we must prevent. Not by any means, but only by sustainable means. Since if the growth is not sustainable, then one day the industry will collapse and cause us greater problems can even foresee today. In the past, the industry has grown even faster than it grows today. And if these growth rates could be regained, aquaculture could even bridge the gap on its own. We must, however, remember that the world will not end in 2030, or at least, I hope not. And it is therefore good to know that the aquaculture industry can even respond to fish demand post-2030. Ladies and gentlemen, some of you will undoubtedly, and not unreasonably, be thinking, this guy is crazy. Aquaculture can never produce as much fish as this without seriously damaging the environment. Maybe so. But who else can then produce the animal proteins, the omega-3 fatty acids, and all the other nutrients we talked about earlier to feed the growing world population? The fact is that from the point of view of an ecological footprint, aquaculture does very well compared to terrestrial animal protein food systems. And some of them, like mollusks, supply additional ecosystem services beyond their food production. In general, the run-of-the-mill aquaculture species does about as well, if not better, than the best of the terrestrial species are doing in this respect. I'm not saying stop producing meat in terrestrial livestock food systems. Being an old terrestrial animal veterinarian, I wouldn't dream of doing that. But don't tell me there are more environmental constraints to producing fish than other animal, animal proteins when the facts show the exact opposite. So ladies and gentlemen, where do we go from here in our attempts to provide the growing world population with healthy and nutritious food produced in a sustainable manner? Well, one way is the blue growth aquaculture pathway. Then we need to do two things. One is increase aquaculture production in countries with little or no aquaculture. And we need to intensify aquaculture, if possible, in countries where extensive low productivity production systems are predominant. This is not necessarily an easy task, but many countries have done it, and therefore we have experiences to learn from that can hasten our advance. In this industry, both the government and the private sector have roles to play, and cooperation is a vital element. I'm not going to go into this in detail, since this would really require at least another half hour presentation. However, I would like to emphasize that this has to be done sustainably, since otherwise we may be courting disaster. Likewise, 
from the perspective of environmental effect, it matters a lot how it is done. This is non-fed or low input aquaculture is extremely environmentally friendly. This also means that how we intensify is a big issue and sustainability as well as the socio-economic factors matter greatly. The chain of events shown here, for instance, for the intensification under extensive conditions that would lead to a greater productivity as well as less governmental impacts. Senoras y señores, espero que algunas de las ideas que he presentado sean de utilidad. A mucho más para discutir, pero el tiempo es limitado. Sin embargo, espero reunirme con ustedes a través de este medio más tarde para abordar sus preguntas dentro de lo posible. Por ahora, muchas gracias por su paciencia.